is that part. Uh, that extra gear, the first three steps. Huge strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today. All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear. And today we are sitting with uh, Jake McGee, Dr. McGee. For, I think this might be one of the first doctors I've had on, so I'm a little nervous right now. You're checking me out here, see what you can do on me. No, but um, we've got a really, really cool topic. I'm, I'm going to introduce the topic first and then kind of get a little bit of your background as well. But um, you've come with uh, a bunch of bunch of information basically on the NHL, the NHL salary cap, talking about what players make. But more importantly, and really interesting, and I, this is a topic that's come up on Spit and Chicklets with, I know, Biz Nasty, Paul Biz, and that's all over tax brackets and what it's like in different states and what it's like in Canada. And you've kind of broken it down in a really cool way where you're looking at what a player can make in different markets, whether it's Canada, U.S., different states, um, and what that difference is for what they make and what their take home is. And I think I read the, I read your article and, and obviously I've known you kind of indirectly for a long time with, with, with your kids playing hockey and stuff like that. But um, I was really, really intrigued by it, number one. And then when I read the article, I was like, it, I've known about it, I've thought about it, but I've never do- kind of taken a deep dive into it. So today I think it could be really, really interesting for, for anyone listening and stuff like that. But um if, if, if anyone came up to you on the street, what's, uh, what, what are some things that, uh, that kind of pop off as far as uh, you, your life, and what you do? So you're obviously a doc, a surgeon. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm a surgical oncologist, so uh, uh, I operate on women uh, who have gynecologic cancer, so sort of cancers below the diaphragm. So that mm-hmm. usually stops most conversations if I don't want to <laughs> yeah. talk to you. Um, so that's sort of my work. I also do, uh, do some research uh, at, uh, at Western and... Um, I kind of specialize in outcomes research uh, using, uh, uh, it's actually used to be called ISIS, uh, ISIS research. Uh, and Uh-oh. see your eyes go up, but it's uh, the Institute for Clinical Value of Sciences. And so now we say uh, ICES or I call it ISIS the good if I'm doing a presentation. So, so you've got, you got, you're in like two areas here that like people don't even want to talk to you about. They're just like, okay, <laughs> well, I don't, yeah, I next conversation. It's a, it's a joke, but it basically yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's all your health information is stored, uh, uh, centrally and we can access it not as you but as a general uh, person and yeah. it's like a bunch of lego the information's there all you got to do is put it together and build something so i do uh, research in that regard and then uh i've uh i've got a big family we were chatting about it. i got five kids that's crazy yeah. that's insane i got two and i'm just scrambled eggs that's why I, I used to have a full head of hair about seven years ago and now look at me yeah, I get chirped uh, quite a bit by my 15-year-old about the hair, but I let him know where it's <laughs> you going. Still yeah. Yeah, you still got it. Yeah, you still got it. I don't know. Yeah, I just right. got it cut. I was looking like a mangy coyote. I had the, the COVID hair. Did yeah. you? Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. nice. That's good. It's always a good excuse to knock an haircut, though, right? And see how, see how long it could go. Well, I was amazed at how many people were coming up to me saying, like, oh, you're growing your hair long. You need to get a haircut. And then I was like, oh, yeah. And they're like, no, you really need to get your haircut. And I thought, do I look that offensive? But uh, Yeah. So, uh, g- kind of, I guess for you, I, a little bit, just to give people a little bit of background, but you have a little bit of a hockey background, obviously just even, you know, your, yourself with, 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 you know, hockey dad and stuff, but you got, you know, your son played, your daughters play. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anyone's, uh, who knows me, heard you say I had a hockey background, they'd laugh. I'm a, I'm a solid third liner on a <laughs> Sunday morning with uh, four subs and, uh, Hey, we all play dogs. Sunday morning now. Yeah. You're good. You're good. Yeah. I play before you play though. It's, uh, <laughs> I have the early slot and, um, uh, so I like hockey, but I've sort of come to it more as an adult. But uh, my kids play, and uh, I got a son who plays Triple A, and a daughter who's uh, in the uh, Devilettes organizations. Um, and I was a trainer a couple years ago for uh, for uh, the Knights Triple A team, and uh, so I've been involved in that. that oh, that's cool. Yeah, and now I we- just like hockey, and uh, yeah, I mean, this idea probably came about because of spring hockey. Um, I was down in. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to get into it? Or you yeah, want to, yeah. No. No. Let's do it. Yeah. I'm just gonna slide it a little closer. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I was. Uh, I was in Toronto, it was 2016, and it was around the time when Stamkos was on the market, and uh, uh, I'm not a big Toronto fan, like, uh, I grew up in southwestern Ontario, but it's one of the, one of the good things that happened to me is I didn't become a Toronto fan, Yeah, you yeah. Know, uh, <laughs> dodged, you dodged a little bit of a bullet there. Yeah, because of the, the pain for that poor, those poor fans. <laughs> I got a buddy who's seen every game since he was seven, and I just think, what an incredible, uh, poor investment of your time. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so they were talking about, uh, oh, Stamco's going to sign in Toronto, and he's going to get ten and a half million. He's going to get full term, and and he ends up signing in um, in Tampa for eight and a half. And then everyone said, well, he's taking a discount to to stay with the team that drafted him. And I thought, well, I don't think that's what's going on. And I looked at the tax rates, and uh, he was actually going to make more money in uh, in uh, in Tampa than he was going to be making in Toronto, making two million dollars less. And I thought, well, that's good for Stamkos. He's still making it. But what I thought was really interesting about it is that's another $2 million that they're going to save against a salary cap that they can now go pay another player. And even though we hear people talk like all the time about 
it's an advantage to be in these low tax uh, districts. They don't talk about what that means from a salary cap perspective. They only put it down to the player level. Yeah. You know, they, I just heard a podcast. They had Versteeg on. He was talking about signing in Florida and, you know, he was going for the low tax and he got traded back. But um, they don't talk about what that means for the discount on the salary cap. Which is crazy because when now, especially with the salary cap era, you're as a GM and ownership, you're trying to put it together the best team you can, obviously, but you're stuck. On a, on, a, on a floor or on a ceiling, I should say, where you can't go above that. So you've got to really be smart on how you're signing players. But the thing with the Stamkos, um, and everyone knows who Steve Stamkos is, obviously, and I know Toronto fans are super excited to get him back home, and man, he's going to play here. But when you look at the numbers, like he was going to sign for just over $10 million a year is kind of what the what the rumor was. Um, and that would have, you know, he ended up signing for 8.5, I think is kind of what yeah, he had, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, so if you look at, um, you know, uh, so there's a whole there's a whole bunch of arguments, and we'll maybe talk a bit later about why my argument might break down or be hard to uh, to implement. But uh, you know, before I you know reach out to you saying, "Hey, I got this idea," I uh, I vetted it by uh, a lot of people know. I mean, we're lucky in London; we got a lot of ex NHLers, so you bump into them in various uh, capacities. And uh, so I asked them, and they're like, "Oh yeah, it's an interesting idea." Um, and then uh, I know a couple accountants on the team. They'll be glad that I'm doing this because maybe I'll stop talking about this idea. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, just bugging them. Yeah, well, they because it's tax rules are hard to. I'm not, you know, I'm not an accountant. Yeah. I didn't even take high school accounting, so uh, I'm not the guy to uh, to do your taxes. But um, uh, I ran it by an accountant who uh, he he had some NHLers uh, 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 that he's done the taxes for, and I said, "What do you think of this?" And he says, "Yeah, there's probably something uh, to this," and so that's why I felt confident enough to take it forward. But um, anyway, Stamkos, uh, you know, he signs in um, in Florida. He probably domiciles there, meaning for tax purposes, that's where he pays it. And his tax rate's uh, 39.31%. So um, uh, whereas if he'd signed in Toronto, it would have been 53.5%. That's the highest tax it's crazy, bracket. crazy, yeah. But it's a huge difference, yeah. right? So, you know, I'm ignoring signing bonuses when I look into all this and other ways that you might be able to skirt some taxes. But um, his take-home after tax in... in um, in Tampa, it's five point one six million. In um, had he signed in Toronto, he would have only pocketed four point eight million. It's crazy. So two things: he's making more money playing in Tampa, but more importantly, he just saved Tampa two million against the salary cap. Yeah, and then so I kind of extended it because uh, you always hear everyone complaining now, uh, Toronto fans and all the sportscasters about what um, what they're paying their top uh, their top four guys right uh, forty point five million for uh, uh, you know Mathers, Nylander, Marner, and um, Tavares. And, um, but if you, you know, when you look at it, what would you have to pay them to in Tampa to give them the same after tax in pocket money? So to make the same amount of money in Toronto that they're making right now, yeah. after tax dollars compared yeah. to what they would make in Tampa, same exact dollars. Yeah. Okay. Because if I'm a guy who's going to sign, I, you know, I care what I'm signing for, you know, on paper and it's going to go out in the media. But not really. I care what I keep in my pocket sure. at the end of the day. Definitely, it's your in pocket yeah. dollars, right? And then I also think this is my chance to, you know, cash in. Um, really make my money. I'm going to support myself for the rest of my life with this, but it's also my chance to maybe plug into a team that can go and win a Stanley Cup. Definitely. And so, um, so um, in uh, in Tampa, um, so you'd be paying them 40.5 million in Toronto. In Tampa, you'd have to pay the, the guys 31.01 million. And that's you know that's obviously considering that their agents and them would be okay with saying, okay, instead of making 11 million dollars a year, I'll make nine because I'm going to end up making more or the same, I should say. Yeah. You know, well, on the, on the take home number that I have in my head, right? Yeah. So yeah. Well, and the reason why you do that, you say go to Tampa, well, because you get to play with oh, uh, for sure. you know, Kucherov and yeah. Kalorin. And they're pretty good. They're like, pretty good. <laughs> they're amazing, right? Like it's yeah. like watching an all star team when yeah. you see those guys. I mean, they're they're out. Um, you know, they were out point, and then they're already out Stamkos, and they still win the game the other yeah. night because they got a guy able to score just an unreal goal. For sure. With less than 10 seconds left. So anyway, what they save there? They saved about nine point three million dollars, and then. Uh, so I've had my kids, so I had uh, my son Vega looking at this, and I'm like, all right, who who have they signed recently? He looked up Vasilevsky. What they sign him for? Nine point five million. Right in that pocket of what they had left over. Like if you look at these two, yeah, the top if four, you right? Use yeah, that as a comparator, yeah. right? Because you could take those four players and find those same four guys over on um, over on uh, Tampa pretty easily, right? Yeah. They, the Tampa has those same kind of all star, sure. high level, high end kind of guys. Now Toronto fans may want to may want to crucify you for saying that because nobody's as good at Matthews, nobody's as good as. Uh, as Marner, I think they're trading all those yeah. guys. Aren't they? Yeah, they I mean, that's might what be. Might have thought right? Yeah, so, yeah, they, yeah. They got some. Uh, they got some work to do for sure. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's really interesting when you look at it that way. And I, I like I said, I've never taken a, a deep dive into this. So when I read the article and kind of looked through it, I was like, 
man, this makes so much sense, especially as a GM. And when you think of like GMs, agents, and players negotiating that contract, these are 100% conversations that go on. Maybe just with the agent and the player. Like, hey, listen, Toronto really wants you, but I can get you to Tampa and you're going to make the same amount of money. You're going to live in Tampa, way less pressure, way... Yeah. I mean, sunny all the time. You can golf year round. You, you can, can live, live on, on the water. The water. Yeah, right? Have yeah. you seen that uh, Kalorna? Yeah, podcast? when they're all on the on their uh, CDs yeah, and stuff. Doc talk, yeah, Yeah. I joke with my friends that we should do one, and we'll drive around on our riding lawnmowers, and uh, <laughs> all the doctors in the neighborhood can talk. You know, yeah, it, it wouldn't be nearly as exciting. <laughs> Didn't fly though, eh? Well, <laughs> we talk about stuff that we shouldn't talk about. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can't record that. You gotta nope. you gotta keep that on the down low. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and so when you're trying to now on the GM side, when you're trying to build your team, obviously that tax bracket or that you know how much these players are getting taxed it definitely plays a role in in signing guys i'm sure right oh yeah like it's not just you know what do you need to win like you need you need uh good scouting and a good gm and you need to have uh, player development you need to have a whole bunch of luck but all those things are available in equal measure to every team but what's not available is five million bucks uh, at the end of the day to sign a defenseman that toronto needed to come play off like how many times have you heard brian burke say that yeah and i think well if he was in tampa bay he'd still have that five million left over like they pay point who's maybe the best player in the league right now or in the playoffs and he, yeah uh, they just pay him uh, just north of six and he's been good for the last couple of years like he's legit right yeah, and he signed he's a yeah. real deal and yeah. uh and you know would you take him as a six million dollar player over um you know pick your toronto player that you want to move and i'm picking on toronto a bit but toronto is uh you know even if you don't like Toronto, you know everything that's going on about them. Well, and, and I think anybody who maybe lives in the United States or, or you know what, other places maybe don't realize what our, how we do get taxed, especially in Ontario with Ottawa. Yeah. Montreal as well. Montreal's just right behind us, I think. But, yeah. I mean, you think of, you know, in that high tax bracket. So I think, you know, in your article I mentioned, I think it's around two hundred and ten or 215000 When you get over that, you're in the 53% yeah. tax bracket. Well, basically, man, half of your earnings, more than half of your earnings is going to the government. Yeah. So you can shelter some, you can figure out ways to kind of skirt it a little bit, but you're still getting pegged pretty hard. Whereas Florida does no, no. And then, you know, well, no tax basically, you know, and people are going to say, Oh, the accountants are going to be pulling money. Sure. And I'm sure that's happening, but I think that happens in equal measure, whether you're in um, Canada Definitely, or the U S yeah. or Sweden yeah. or wherever. Um, yeah. But the other piece is this whole incremental tax rate. And so I looked into that in, uh, in Florida, once again, I'm not an accountant. So, you know, people can kind of crucify me on this stuff yeah. and yeah, sorry, I'm wrong. Um, but uh, I looked at the incremental tax rates and uh, you don't hit the incremental tax rate until over 500,000 in, uh, in Florida. So you're not reaching that highest tax bracket until you're making 500,000. And in, um, in, uh, 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 if you're married, then it's over 600000 Yeah. And so suddenly, a lot of your money is being paid at an even lower tax rate. So now if you're a player thinking about going to Tampa Bay and you're only going to get paid a million or a million and a half or two million, a fair bit of that money is still being paid at a really low tax rate yeah. relative. So the incremental tax uh, um, rates still benefit players in the U.S. and particularly in these states where there, where there's no, um, no, uh, st- no state tax. Yeah. And so, you know, and we haven't said it, but those states, those are Florida, uh, Nevada, um, uh, uh, Texas, and um, and Nashville. Right. Yeah, Tennessee. So, yeah. um, so uh, you know, and, and look at those teams. They're all, they've always been good. Take yeah. the Florida Panthers out of the equation, but that's harder to explain. Yeah, Florida's a bit of an outlier, but I think there's yeah. been other issues there with like just, co- not, not the coaches, but just coaching changes and weird stuff with uh ownership and changing ownership and i know the rinks in a tough spot where they don't get a lot of fans so there's a lot of different things that are going on there for sure and i don't think for whatever reason they just haven't built a good culture there like nashville did now nashville's got a sick setup because their rink is right downtown so you're gonna go there and you're gonna have basically a night you're gonna go out for dinner you're gonna go watch the game and then go out after like it's ottawa's in a similar situation in canada because you think of a canadian team not being able to fill a building or not be able to like get fans out there but they also have a rink that's 20, 30 minutes away from downtown Ottawa. And it's, it's a trek. It's a, you know, you got to think about getting out there. Yeah. Right? Well, so I was nine years in Ottawa. I love, okay, yeah. you know, I love the centers. It was when they were kind of, a, you know, if they had that team now, they'd, they'd win the cup, right? Yeah. They were running good. They were team. good. Yeah. And it was a clutch and grab hockey and they would always lose to Toronto and Toronto wouldn't do anything. Part of my, the, you know, disdain yeah. for Toronto. <laughs> but, um, uh, my wife, she, uh, she studied architecture at Carleton and she, uh, had Bruce Firestone give a lecture and he, gave a lecture about why did we build uh, the rink in Canada. Okay. And uh, it was kind of kind of cool to hear her. I would have liked to have been at a lecture, but to hear her talk about it because basically he said they were going to put it at Lansdowne and that's right by the Glebe. I don't know if you know Ottawa mm-hmm. very well, one of the nice neighborhoods. And I can't remember, there's like, 
I don't know the number, but like 500 and something lawyers in the Glebe, and they all signed a letter saying that they would collectively sue uh, right. the Ottawa senators if they put the building there because they didn't want that impact yeah. on their neighborhood. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it'd be great, but maybe, you know, if you're a family person and, you yeah. know, you're beyond those... Uh, you know, party in years, then you don't want to have uh, 20,000 people come into your, uh, your neighborhood every uh, fourth night. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I can so that's see why that. they ended up out in Canada. And then I'm sure there were a lot of you know benefits to them being out there, yeah. but it's a pain to leave, uh, to get out to that rink and to come back after a game. And uh, yeah. And, and Arizona's another one, right? Same thing. They got the rink outside, like kind of outside of the city. It's, it's a really cool spot. They built up around it now, but it's still for the locals there that want to go watch a game. It's still a 20, 30 minute, 40 minute drive parking, all that yeah. stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's part of Florida's demise. There's no doubt about it. And hopefully they can kind of correct it and figure that out. But um, I, I thought when they got Dale Talon that he'd kind of figure it out because he seems to be a really ho- smart hockey guy, but it didn't yeah. seem to work out for him Maybe, there maybe it's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they can't do it down there. They got a good team on paper. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah no, they're, yeah, they definitely have some players, man. And, and they're in a low tax bracket, so they, yeah. they're happy. <laughs> they're, they're doing they well. They should have figured it out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's a structured advantage, and uh, if if you do it right, then it can be to your benefit. Yeah, this is kind of uh, remember the movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt, where they uh, were, were kind of like different, but you're looking at these different analytics a little bit on how to build a team and how to make it work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, and some teams are unfortunate handcuffed because there's nothing they can do about the tax bracket. Really, now you had a couple, and I want to get into the playoff stuff in a sec because I think that's sure. really interesting as well. Yeah. But um, you had a couple ideas about kind of be, maybe like there's potentially some solutions out there now they're not perfect and they're not you know this isn't potentially but there's some stuff to think about and some some thought process behind it but one of the things that you talked about is almost having a bit of um like a floating salary cap so if you're in a high tax bracket area your salary cap be a little bit higher to reflect that higher tax bracket that that you're paying your players the other thing too to keep in mind is for you know we're for all the Canadian teams they're paying American dollars so they're they're paying paying American dollars right so that's not even an argument um, no, but even for the Canadian teams as well, like that for if you're running a Canadian business paying everyone in American dollars, that's still a, that's that's a bit of a hit on them too, right? Oh, I think it's difficult. Like yeah. Toronto, they're laughing, they'll yeah. always do well and probably Vancouver. But I don't know after that, these smaller market teams. Uh, I don't know if Calgary how much money they actually make as an organization and then yeah. you think about the Winnipegs and the uh um the Ottawa's, I'm sure Montreal does great. I yeah. It's, it's uh yeah, it's their culture. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, so kind of explain a little bit on, on what your thought process was behind kind of floating the cap a little sure. bit and, and how yeah. that may look if, if that was a solution or did work as a solution. Yeah, so I mean, when I talk about this, I'm sort of assuming that everyone is domiciling uh, where they play, meaning that they pay that tax rate. But that might, that's probably not actually the case. If I'm someone like Austin Mathers, I do my best to uh, to domicile for my tax purposes in, uh, in Phoenix because, you know, on a what's he make 11 million bucks a year that he's saving over a million dollars. So, you know, you always hear about him flying back to Phoenix. Well, he's got to spend X number of days there, I'm sure. But I don't know that for a fact, but I think that's probably the case. But I, so, so that assumption might be wrong. And that's probably a, uh, it's an area of criticism for sure. When I talk about this, but I think what should happen is, you know, I think players should get whatever they get, right. They have short careers and they're the, you know, the the best, uh, the, you know, the elite guys of a, of a very large cohort that try and get into the NHL. So pay them what they're worth. But I think uh, in the low tax uh, districts, give them the eighty one point five million. That's their cap, right? Um, but in uh, in other jurisdictions where the tax rate is much higher, you need to float that cap up. And so, um, in Toronto, uh, for or Toronto or Ottawa, in Ontario, which is where the highest taxes are paid, uh, they should have a salary cap that's around one hundred six million, hundred a little bit more than that actually. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so let's, so then it gets to be interesting because let's say you sign a guy, um, and now they've signed, uh, and I hate to pick on Tavares cause he's getting picked on right now sure. uh, for how the Leafs did. Yeah. Uh, I think he's a good. Player. And the fact that the Islanders are going deep right now and they're, yeah, yeah. exactly. And they don't have a uh, Tavares on their team. Really. Right. I mean, I guess they do Barzell, but, yeah. um, anyway, uh, he signed, what he signed for 11 million or close to that. Right. Yep. So he signed for 11 million. Um, you know, and he's still a good player, still putting up the points. But in three or four years, how are you going to trade an $11 million player who's starting to decline now? That's a tough contract to get rid of. Compare him to Stamkos. Let's say they're equivalent players. You, it, I think it's a little bit easier to, to move an $8.5 million sure. uh, contract, right? Yeah. Um, so so what I think should happen is, or what could happen, is um, you have kind of a, an equalization of sort. So that when you play for... Um, when you when you play for Toronto, you sign for whatever eleven million, and you make up whatever percentage of their salary cap. Um, but then, if you get traded to another organization, and and then for tax purposes, you can domicile there. 
you uh, get paid a lesser amount, still makes up the same amount, or so it still makes up the same amount of the total salary cap. So if it was seven percent in Toronto, it would be seven percent in uh, in Vegas. But now it's um, uh, now it's seven percent of eighty one point five million. So you're you're on paper getting less money, but your in pocket money is the same because you're paying taxes now in uh, in Vegas. Yeah. Now, so, in the middle of a season when you get traded, I don't know how that would look for, uh, from yeah. an accounting perspective. But if you're there for years and years, then it does make sense. Yeah, but that's up to the bean counters to figure that out. Well, that's we're not, up to we're just coming up with ideas here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you were supposed to have Messier on the podcast and he canceled, so you called me, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. So I'm, that's filling, right. I'm filling the airtime for you. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no, it is interesting because then, you know, at the end of the day, let's be honest, for anybody, whether you work at the grocery store, your doctor, your uh, NHL player, you're, you're not concerned, but you're looking at what you're taking home. It's great that you're making X amount of dollars, but that's awesome. But what am I taking home? What am I taking home every two weeks or every month or whatever that is? So I think for the players as well, if you get traded at a $8 million contract to a high tax bracket, yeah, maybe on paper now you're only making six, but you're making the same amount of money on your take home or close to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that, yeah. And I, I mean, that's, it's obviously something that, cause the one thing when, when I look at a, a model like this, I think that you're going to have the management coaches, probably players on board this is sweet the owners would be like no because yeah. some owner in wherever doesn't want to have 105 million dollars because i was like holy man now i gotta potentially get to that you know if we want to win we're gonna have to try to get to that or close to it are you gonna pay yeah. guys and yeah well you'd have to have some sort of equalization going back so whereas a team like toronto probably gives a ton of money to other teams across the league in terms of revenue sharing some of that revenue would have to come back for player salaries I think what ultimately would happen, given you know who holds the balance of power in the NHL, is that uh, the, there would be no more eighty-one point five million for the lowest tax brackets. They would drop down, sure, and maybe the others would go slightly above, but it would still equal you know yeah. eighty-one point five Makes times sense. the number of teams in the yeah. league. Yeah, I think that's probably more what would happen. But I'm not yeah. trying to say that's what should happen. I don't think I, I like the idea of, of raising it up and yeah. then just having income sharing. But it, yeah, it brings up it brings up an interesting topic though, really. Like when you really think about it, right? Yeah. And then okay, this is all great. It's good. Like yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'm sure people listening are like, oh man, I didn't realize that. You know, um, one other example before we get into the playoffs. But one other example too that you brought up was and someone that's local here, but Nick Suzuki, who's yeah. young guy, great guy, hasn't really got his feet yet wet in the NHL yet, or yeah, hadn't hadn't got his feet wet in the NHL yet, and then yeah. gets traded before he ever ever gets a chance to play a game and. You know, by get by getting traded from Vegas, anyone who doesn't know Nick Suzuki got drafted first round. Uh, you know, Vegas prospect gets kind of thrown in the deal. I think with Pacioretty, and yeah. he gets you know yeah, thrown in that deal and them. awesome, yeah, now great, well, good prospect. They, they can win now, but looking great for Montreal because they yeah. Win, yeah, and he's you know he's a hell of a player. Obviously, we yeah. you know kind of knew that, but gets to Montreal and then has a chance. You know, now he's playing. Yeah. But it takes, I think, a hundred twenty thousand dollar haircut on the trade, basically. Well, because so I, I was at a game and uh, one of my son's game, and uh, his dad uh, was there, and so I just sitting with him and chatting. I was like, "Hey, uh, you know, was Nick upset because he just gotten traded the summer before?" I said, "Was he upset that he got traded from uh, from uh, a low tax bracket to a high tax bracket?" And he said, "Well, he wasn't, but you know, Dad was upset. I, I looked and he lost one hundred twenty thousand dollars, but." You know, he goes to Montreal. He's like yeah. big man on campus. They love him, and there's huge potential there for him to uh, to um, you know get sponsorships and endorsements and that kind of thing. But you know, at the same time, not everybody wants to sell cheap internet or cable TV, right? Like you think about the Mitch Marner commercials that you, right. you watch, right? They're yeah. entertaining. I liked them, but uh, yeah. not everybody wants to do that. And yeah. maybe maybe also you know want to be in Nashville and go to a concert and have nobody know who you are versus yeah. trying to do that in Montreal. Sure. Um, but uh, so, uh, you know, I thought about him and, you know, what's he going to sign for? And I think when I wrote the, uh, so I wrote this article, it's, this is totally got out because of COVID or got, it never got out. No, I couldn't get anyone to publish it because yeah. I'm a doctor. I'm not a, a sports guy. <laughs> right. and I don't know anyone and you're, yeah. so then I, yeah, anyway. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, at that time I, I said, oh, maybe he'd make 6 million. But if you look at his performance in the playoffs, he's probably going to make even more than that. Yeah. Right? Who knows? Right. I mean, yeah. he's doing, yeah, for yeah. sure. He could yeah. end up signing for a, uh, for a nice penny. Yeah. Definitely. But let's say something happens in Montreal and they go to trade him back to uh, to Vegas. If they sign him for seven million or eight million dollars or whatever they sign him for in uh, in Montreal, that's a huge contract going back the other way. You know, a seven or eight million dollar player. That's not a uh, you know a Nick Suzuki as good as he is. That's a you know a Connor McDavid or a Kucherov or a, a top 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 player. And um, and so he gets to be a hard contract to move going back. Yeah. But if his if his if his salary then dropped down to that percentage aspect that I was talking about earlier. Now he um, he is you can trade any player right because he's going to be uh, relative worth whatever your salary cap is. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And he wouldn't take a, a true pay cut because from the tax purposes perspective, he'd still have the same uh, same take home in pocket money. Yeah. This is going to be potentially, I think for young guys, like, uh, you know, and I'm not speaking for any of the young players out there, but I think for a young guy just breaking in the NHL, I mean, they're making $750,000 or a million dollars. Like, yeah. I'm 21 years old. This is fine. I don't care if I lose like 100 grand because yeah. when we were young, we yeah. were making that kind of money, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think this is one of those things that if you look at like kind of old school hockey, how did the NHLPA come in? Well, the older guys fought for that because they wanted benefits. They wanted you know, more security, more, they wanted to have a, a bit of a voice against the owners and against, you know, so I think it feels to me that this is going to be something that the older players are going to have to see value in or the management or somebody's going to have to come up with that and say, and kind of fight for it a little bit. If this is something that ever comes to fruition, right? Yeah. Like, and I, and got a it's flat cap right now. It's 81.5 yeah. million. So it gets to be that much more important to consider aspects of, you know, trying to make the league fair, right? Because that's the great thing about uh, the NHL now. There are so many good teams. Yeah. And uh, it's because of this parity that's been brought in primarily by the salary cap, I think. But I think you can tweak it even further to make things even better. Yeah. Now, um, is the league interested in doing that? Who knows, right? Yeah. You know, who has a horse in this race? Well, Toronto does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think some of the teams in the high tax bracket could be like, yeah. hey, wait, this could help us like build a better or build a more, you know, even a more competitive team. Cause now let's get into that a little bit. So looking at, you know, in front of you gamblers out there, you might want to tune in here a little bit because there, there could be another way of picking your bets. But, um, but I mean, you, you kind of went through the playoffs and looked at some of the teams that were in and, and just, I, I mean, the numbers that you show me were, all, were strictly on taxes, right? Yeah, on yeah. what states or what, you know, yeah. what cities these teams were in. So last night, so I, you know, I knew I was going to be talking to you today. So I uh, got my 11 year old to. That's uh, right. 11 year old. Yeah. So if an 11 year old can do it, I think we all can do it. And I should say any of these, any of this math was checked by my 15 year old and my 11 year old. And so, <laughs> so you're good. Like, does this make sense? Because, you know, we don't really do math anymore <laughs> in life, right? So it's ironclad. Yeah. So, uh, so I got her to put the, uh, to tell me what the bracket was. And then we put the tax rates in. And if you look in the first round, uh, okay, wait, I got to stop you right here though. Yeah. So how, um, this is a parenting question. Yeah. How do you get your kids to help you do your research for you? Well, is there any <laughs> carrot there or are they, are they kind of cool with it? Well, so they are so tired of me talking about this. <laughs> in fact, I think anyone who knows me is probably just tired of me talking, but tired of me talking particularly about this topic because it's one of these things that's been bugging me and I haven't been able to get it out. And then I sort of feel when I listen to different podcasts that people are chipping away at it. People are starting to see yeah. it. And I'm like, uh, you know, I think I texted you and I said, uh, you know, any ideas in research, we think if you have a, a novel idea, it's good for about three months and then someone else is going to think it and then sure. Do it. Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking about this for three years. So I'm like, someone else is going <laughs> to figure this out for sure. And, uh, and then where's my glory, right? Yeah. This, yeah, this yeah. Is it right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's not much, but we're, we're, we're talking, so that's good. Yeah. No, but I, uh, well, they like sports uh, yeah. they like hockey. We watch a lot of hockey at home and, um, and uh, I got to be honest, they were intrigued when I told them I was going on this or cool. doing this with you. Yeah, yeah, so, cool. Yeah, you sold it. There you there go. You go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right, sorry. So, yeah, no, continue. But my son, we actually, we tried to, um, you know, because I do some stats, guys. I got a master's, uh, some stats. I've got a master's in epidemiology. And um, and uh, so so initially I thought, oh, I'll break it down. I'll look at the playoffs. But it gets tough when you look at um, teams moving from one market to an or one uh, division to another, yeah. And then um, you look at uh, um, you look at when the salary cap came in. It was really hard to kind of show it that way. And I thought, well, it's probably best not to go down that hole. But we we made like a whole chart. I got value to yeah, do yeah. That. And this is back, and they're not going cool. to school. They got to yeah. do something. But you know, yeah, a little bit of skating and working out. Uh, yeah, there's got to be something else that goes on. So anyway, yeah. When I told her I was going on here, she said, I'm "Happy to happy to do it." So um, so we uh, we put out the bracket and we looked at the first round and we said, uh, if you just look at, uh, who has the lower, um, uh, uh, tax bracket, income tax bracket, um, uh, and then who won, uh, income tax accurately predicts, uh, who won five out of eight times in the first round. But I think it's actually five out of seven times, because if you look at, um, you know, Colorado played Phoenix and the difference in their tax is 0.09, um, uh, percent. So, a wash. so that one's a wash. It's a wash. So I'm yeah. going to say five out of seven times it accurately predicted who was going to win. Take it to the second round of the playoffs. Three out of those four times it accurately predicted who was going to win. Wow. So, and if you look at who's going to be in the finals, you know one's going to be from a state uh, where with, low. with no, there's no state tax. Right. Um, and then the other one, I still think it's going to be Tampa over the Islanders. So you're going to have two teams uh, from the absolute lowest income tax bracket. That's crazy. Playing in the Stanley Cup. Yeah. yeah. 
Let's go through Final. just real quick. So uh, you have it down there, I think, right? Like, so the first round, who, who are the teams in advance? Do you have them on there? Yeah, yeah. So you got, uh, so you had uh, Vegas and Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Delta, the difference, the Delta, if you will, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. between the two is um, is over 4%. Uh, um, so, you know, you look at 80, $81 million. And for any, like, true hockey fan out there, it's like, this is ridiculous. I get it. Like, I love hockey. And, like, yeah, Chicago might have been able to win that with a hot goalie and Kane lighting it up. I get it. We're not we're not saying that you got to pick your winners, uh, you know, by doing this. But it is interesting to, to to look at the numbers, and I think it's something to look at even going back a year or two to see, and going forward a year or two just to see how it works out. Like you know, do yeah. do, the, do the teams with lower tax brackets get you know have better playoff success or have better teams, basically, right? Like well, we looked at wild card uh, wild card teams. So you know, each each what is it, each division puts two teams forward, and then they're two wild card teams. And yeah, it absolutely predicts in terms of wild card. But I thought, well, that's a little bit too esoteric for uh, for <laughs> yeah. the average hockey person to uh, to yeah. get into, right? So and I thought, how are you going to show that? And yeah, you know, when I finally typed this up, it was too long anyway, right? Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Okay, um, so keep going. So you had Chicago and uh, so you got Chicago, yeah. and Vegas, Vegas advanced, yeah. right? Um, now everyone's going to say, of course they advance their bandwagon team, and they totally sure. are. Yeah, uh, they're a great team, but uh, but we're just talking taxes. Here. Yeah, we're just numbers yeah. right now. We're numbers. Yeah, and then uh, you got Colorado Phoenix, and um, uh, the difference between those Phoenix actually has they're forty three point eight five percent. Colorado's forty three point nine four percent. Vancouver advance, or sorry, um, uh, Colorado advances there. And then uh, you got Dallas, Calgary, uh, Dallas advances. The difference between uh, that, yeah, that, that, that bracket's uh, over 8%. Okay. Yeah. So um, so pretty substantial, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and then you got St. Louis, uh, Vancouver, and uh, Vancouver advance there. And uh, that was that's one of the, the outliers, right? Yeah. Um, now you could say, well, they're they're punching above their weight class, and uh, and maybe they're a good team. They got a lot of great young players on it, but are they as good? And are they going to be able to keep it together? Right? They got to yeah. sign. They got to sign Markstrom now. They they're in a tough one, man, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So you know, but hey, if you were in Tampa, you'd have uh, uh, an extra, I don't know, something like eleven million uh, to to put again to put into player contract. Yeah. Because. Uh, Players are just worried about what they're keeping in their pocket. They're not worried about what's on paper. Yeah, and again, when you say that 11 million, just so just so it's kind of clear to people, but yeah. that 11 million difference is basically saying that Toronto signs all these guys, and Tampa could potentially sign them a little bit lower because they're going to make more than they're yeah. going to than their take home in yeah. Toronto. And that's yeah. about 11 million dollar difference between yeah. what Toronto would pay all those players and yeah, what from uh, the absolute yeah. highest ta- income tax bracket. Um, districts if you will to the lowest that's a lot of money man for a team to have extra money to be able to sign players like 11 million dollars you can sign two or three decent players or one two braden points right Right. for what they signed them for right yeah it's crazy Um, so yeah yeah anyway so uh keep going carrying on yeah you got um uh uh uh, philadelphia and the canadians and uh, philadelphia won that series you know the canadians are over 53 percent uh whereas philly's around uh uh, just shy of 47 percent so six yeah. percent delta's there right yeah and then uh tampa bay and columbus uh tampa obviously won that one although columbus looked pretty good but uh columbus is 46.81 uh, percent uh tampa's uh like i said 31.3 uh you got the caps and uh, the new york islanders this is another one where the islanders uh managed to get through despite having the higher income tax rate are they're, they're probably both pretty high are they yeah, so 45 uh, for the Caps and uh, 48 for the New York Yeah, Islanders. okay. So we'll get to the, the number is 46%, and we'll talk about okay, that in a second. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, and then uh, Boston and um, uh, Carolina, and then uh, Boston got through, and they're they're about the same, but uh, Boston's a little bit less than 44%. Yeah. So then you get to the second round, and it's uh, uh, Boston-Tampa. Tampa gets through, yeah. lower tax rate. Uh, New York Islanders and Philly, uh, the Islanders get through. Um, and then uh, Vegas and Vancouver, Vegas gets through, Dallas and Colorado, Dallas gets through. So three of those four teams yeah. are from uh, states with no state tax, and they're abs- the absolute lowest income tax uh, of any district across the league. It's interesting, man. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. So, and yeah. I, it's funny because you, you said it earlier, and you hear this all the time, but oh, you took a hometown discount, right? And I think sometimes yeah. players do. Like You look at a guy like Crosby. Uh, you know, back, you know, and he wants to win and he's probably, you know, makes a lot of money on other things as well. But yeah, what's he paying for tax? Um, Just put it in there. Yeah. Pitt played Montreal in first round, right? Yeah. Pittsburgh. So they're 45%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you think so. But even for Crosby, sorry, I yeah. don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. at 45%, it's a, it's a higher tax bracket, but it's not 53 Right, so he's, oh, his take home yeah. still not terrible for yeah. the amount of money he's making. He's a Canadian kid. He's gonna, yep. you know what I mean. So it's yeah, for sure he'll yeah. domicile in uh, in Pittsburgh. Yeah, right, and then head back yeah. to Nova Scotia and summer home. Yeah, yeah, summer, summer home. home. Yeah, I'm yeah, and McKinnon. Yeah, yeah, it'll work out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're probably there right now. <laughs> totally. Yeah, they might be listening. They're actually probably just hi. getting off the course right yeah. now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but uh, so 46% is an interesting number because uh, w- when we think of the last Canadian team to win the cup, it was the Canadians, right? And that was back in uh, 93. And um, if you look since that time, uh, we've given out the Stanley Cup 25 times because of lockouts and stuff. Um, including those halves, only eight of the 26 teams that won uh, were from a district where the uh, tax bracket was less than 46%. Really? Or sorry, sorry, greater than yeah, 46%. Bigger, so, yeah, greater okay. than 46%. So, so only ex- eight times. Only eight times, right? And um, and more than half of the, t- I, I think the number is 17 uh, teams, are, are, but more than half are from um, uh, f- from uh, districts where the, the income tax is more than 46%. And if you look at since the... Um, the uh, um, uh, salary cap came into play. Only three teams have uh, from districts where the the taxes are higher than that have won, and that's uh, Vegas and then Anaheim. Or not wow. Vegas. Uh, sorry, the Kings and then Anaheim. Right, and the Kings won it twice and then Anaheim. But both of those teams are yeah, struggling. Right, yeah. like how are they going to rebuild? They've got you know some great players, but they're on big contracts. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you got to sign those players for big money because they know uh, what their after tax take home is, right? When they're paying uh, north of 50% uh, yeah. tax back to the government. Yeah. Such a big, yeah, it's such a, and this is all obviously like old man talk or dad talk, right? Because some <laughs> young kids are like, what? The rink. Yeah, taxes? <laughs> are you kidding me? Who pays taxes? Uh, but it, it is so interesting, man, especially as you yeah. get older and, and you're thinking about this stuff a little bit more and, and, and how much we do get taxed in certain areas and states as well. But Canada, we, we're all well aware of this, obviously. And everyone will kind of alluded to more of like, well, we don't pay for school. We don't pay for health care, things like that, which I agree. You know, well, that's all good. I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I don't appreciate what we get for our yeah, taxes. For you know, sure. We, we, you know, I, I wouldn't take that, uh, you know, generally speaking, I wouldn't take the U.S. over Canada by a long shot. Yeah, but yeah. If you're, you know, a wealthy individual in the U.S., you do pretty well. And some of these hockey players are, are wealthy, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. No, definitely. But when you look at, like, the sports side of it, uh, mm-hmm. it's it's a really interesting topic to talk about. And even, like, if you went to basketball or you went to other things, you know what I mean, other yeah. sports, same thing. Like, there's not as many maybe Canadian teams as there are with hockey, right? But Well, there's a couple th- couple things. Number one, I, I'm not that interested. In ba- I like basketball, but not yeah, that yeah. much. And uh, I yeah, I could take or leave baseball. You know, yeah. come playoffs, I might watch it. But um, uh, the majority of those players are from the U.S. for both of those sports. Right? Yeah. Whereas uh, in Canada, it's a different story, and we only have uh, you know two professional uh, sports teams. Um, you know, the, the Raps and the the Blue Jays in those leagues. Whereas yeah, that's true. We have a lot of Canadian teams. So yeah. You know, really, where I started thinking about this is I thought it's almost impossible for a Canadian team to win uh, the Stanley Cup based on uh, income tax alone. Yeah, just because they have such a disadvantage in terms of who they can sign and what they can sign them for. That's yeah. So basically, this is poor Canada. <laughs> poor us. I guess oh so. man, I never thought of it that way. Well, you know, once your team's out, you want Vancouver to win. Yeah, you yeah, want whoever for sure. To win yeah, every you, year. Yeah, you know, it means yeah. more, and it's just fun to watch a Canadian team and what it does to those markets. Yeah, yeah. But no, that's yeah, that's a really because we haven't had a good. I mean, we had some close calls in the last little bit. Ottawa made a good run years ago, and. Uh, you know, we've had some some decent runs by teens, but nothing nothing yeah. close in in a, in a while, obviously, right? And this could be one of the reasons why. Who knows, right? Is yeah. just the financials of it, and yeah. being able to get those players that you need. Like for instance, you look at some of the teams. Um, you know, let's call it Edmonton needs a goalie. Well, you know, is there money left over there for a goalie? Like for a high end eight yeah. nine million dollar goalie, which is what they're going for now, and probably not, right? Depending on they've got some big money tied up and some good players that they want to sign. Yeah. Um, and you know, Toronto, well, they maybe need a defenseman. they need a right. lot of things in Edmonton. Yeah. yeah they have got a couple yeah. holes there. Um, but it's hard, right? If you don't have the money, man, it, you know, where do you get that money from? Right. Yeah. And, well, and how do you lure someone in? And, uh, you know, I think if you had some sort of equalization, then you wouldn't have players, you know, putting the higher tax, uh, bracket teams in, um, on their no trade list. Right. I think they'd yeah. be like, yeah, no, happy to go to Edmonton, uh, because, Hey, they got uh, two of the best players in the world and chance to win the cup and play, yeah. you know, I'll get great numbers and might help me sign my next, you know, and there's lots of reasons why you'd want to play there, but there's from a tax perspective, there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't too. For sure. No, definitely. Um, now have you ever, have you ever gone down roads like this with other stuff or is this kind of the one like, like, have, are you, are you known to like find these little pockets and be like, I want to, I want to kind of dig into this a little bit. Well, this is sort of the kind of research stuff that I do. Right? Okay. <laughs> Esoteric who, who, uh, who's really interested in this yeah. it's a small pocket, but this one, uh, I don't know. This one came up. Uh, we'll see what the next one is we work on. I don't know. For sure. Now you mentioned earlier that, uh, that you're in a epidemiology a little bit. Yeah. All right, which is for people that don't know, that's more kind of the. Uh, it's kind of stats. Yeah, yeah, yeah but um, yeah, I'm not as 
good with this, you know, crunching the numbers on the stats. You can only, there's only so many hours in the day and yeah. things you can do. So I'm more uh, thinking about this kind of stuff and then operationalizing it with a stats person yeah. right, who, uh, who's better with the computer and doesn't mind sitting there for several hours doing that. Well, I'm in the OR while that's happening. Usually. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, and I know like just from talking to players and stuff like that about just over the years, just on signing contracts and things like that, this is something that does come up. Like, oh, you're playing in Florida. Oh, sweet. You know, like the players are very well aware of the states that have no tax and things like mm-hmm. that. But the one thing that players do, most players want is they want to win. Yeah. So like would a player go play for the Florida Panthers because they can make more money? Maybe some would for sure. Yeah. But some would be like, you know, no, I, I'd, I'd rather go to Tampa. I'd rather go somewhere else, take a bit of a discount and play there. But when you're looking at different markets like a Canadian market or even an American market with a higher tax bracket, you know, in New York or whatever it is, and then you're looking at, you know, let's say a Tampa, then that that's a big piece there of like my, my take home is way more in Tampa and I still have a chance to win, you know? Yeah, and it looks super fun to ride around on a jet ski in your backyard. Yeah. And, you know, you, uh, who'd you have yet connect me on here? He was talking about going fishing, right? He could go fishing in Tampa. He can't go fishing in Philly. Yeah. It's a tough one yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. You got to drive somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I, I mean, I've heard like stories, even guys obviously just boating to the rink. Yeah. Like just boating over to the rink and the flip flops get out, walk over. Like, you know, it's, it's a, not a bad setup for what sure. What a life, right? Yeah. And then they're talking about the parties and you know how they're getting to and from, right? Yeah. They're not Ubering it. They're uh, taking the jet ski. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so what would you like, what would your kind of like goal be for something like this? Like, obviously, I mean, getting it out a little bit is, is great, but I, I just, is it more just kind of conversation and just kind of getting the idea out there that like, Hey, this is kind of cool and something that like something to think about. Well, so either this is something that's hidden uh, across the league and uh, everyone knows about it and no one ever talks about it. They only take it as far as taking it at the player level, or it's something that uh, they, it's too big a problem for them to actually try and uh, t- tackle because of that whole domicile yeah. aspect. And that might be the case, but I feel like it should at least be talked about and, and they're getting close now. Right. Uh, on spitting chicklets, uh, so uh, Bissonette said, you know, he was talking on one of the recent episodes about, oh, three of the four teams are from uh, uh, low tax or the, you know, no state tax. Yeah. And then uh, um, I was trying to, I don't know if you know, Dan, do you know Danny Anger? He's, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, out of Windsor, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he's, he coaches uh, Essex. And, That's right. Uh, and uh, my kid played from uh, spring hockey. He's okay. a good guy. If, yeah. Uh, and, uh, so I was, I, I went to him with this and he was like, oh, this is a great idea. We should, uh, and then he talked to someone, he said, I'm going to talk to my buddy who works for the Marlies and I'm going to talk to a guy at Windsor university. We'll put this out as an academic article. And I was like, you know, it takes, you know, three years yeah, to tough. get, it takes a long time to get an academic yeah. article out there. I just think conversation wise and, yeah. uh, and I've thought about it. I, uh, I sat down, uh, and I wrote this. So this was my, uh, like Easter Monday, uh, <laughs> home with the kids. It's fourth day in. I, <laughs> I got to do work, honey. And I sat down and I wrote this down to the point where I was like, okay, I can get this out there, but yeah, I'm not on Twitter. Like a guy like me has nothing to gain by being on Twitter and only only lose. And, uh, so I don't, and I emailed, Hey, I got this great idea and it's crickets. I don't get anything back. So yeah, you were the only one who took me up on it. I appreciate it. No, (laughs) cause well, no, but when you reached out, I was like, I talk, I, we've talked about this before with other, with other players and and just buddies and, um, and even talking about what guys are making, like, Whoa, that's crazy. Uh, you know, McDavid's making $12 million a year, but for him to get the take home that makes sense for him, he probably, like, he's yeah, got to get paid, right? Six. Yeah. Now, so, I, you know, his accountant's probably doing a few things sure. for him. So, but it's, yeah. it's, he's losing a, a huge chunk of money and he could, you know, he, you know, he could sign for a lot less in Tampa and make the same. Yeah. Yeah. And he could, you know, probably go golfing and do whatever he does and not be noticed. Right. As, yeah. You know, the superstar that he is. Yeah. Which is another, like, I mean, aside from money or anything like that, that's something that I know his players get more popular and some players love the spotlight and I'm sure it's great, but I, I I'm, you know, at I don't times, think he does. Like, he's no, at times I think guy. you kind of want to just like be a little bit discreet and not have, you know, people in your face all the time and stuff. Right. And I think it, like that's something on a whole other level, but, um, but for this though, I think the big thing with it is, you know, people talk about this all the time. You kind of got in the weeds on a little bit, which I love because it kind of gives you some good numbers on like even the, even the stamp, the stamp was example. And there's millions, like, or not millions, but tons of examples like that in the NHL players that are playing on good markets that are making like, looking at what they're making like man they're not making that much yet but their take home is more than what so-and-so is making you mm-hmm. know when marner was another one that came up when he signed because uh they they were talking about his take home and then what he would what his take home would have been in other markets and it was crazy on how much you know more he would have made all, at the at the number that he had right but um but i think he was thinking take home and that's why they had to give him 10.93 or whatever the nod to and i guarantee yeah. like you know if, if i'm a player like after talking to you about this now and and being in the mix on a little bit on this but 
if I'm sitting across from an e- or a GM talking about this stuff and he's like, listen, we want to offer you nine. Well, I need, a, I would like 11. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big difference, right? Yeah. But then when you say, well, yeah, but my take home is only this with nine and it's this with 11. Yeah. And John Smith down there who got, you know, 15 less goals and he's making more than me in, in Tampa. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so that's another com- conversation that comes up. I'm sure a discussion that. Well, yeah, but like, if that GM says, uh, yeah, but you know, your take home is going to be this here in Tampa and we're going to use that $2 million that you're, you know, you're discounting us, which you're not really discounting yeah. us. We're going to use that $2 million and we're going to put it together and we're going to sign Vasilevsky long-term and you, your entire career, you're going to have an all-star goalie uh, playing behind you. Yeah. You'd be like, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good thing to have, right? If I want to win, because there's two, sure. there's two things that are at play. I want to, I want to make what I can make for the short career I have. And I, I want to, you know put my name into the the record books and have my name on the cup. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. No, that, no, this is great, man. This is really good. Um, if people do want to, want to reach out or anything like that, would you or like, do you want to, cause what, what I'd like to do with it is I'll, I'll end up sharing it obviously and sharing this podcast. And, sure. um, I think it's a, I think it's really, really cool. Like the, the whole topic is cool and not for maybe your hockey fan that just loves watching Keynes, but anybody who's kind of in the weeds on other stuff like salaries and, I mean, you said that you got some of your stuff off cap friendly. I mean, we, I check cap friendly all the time. Yeah. If I'm looking up a player, I'm looking at what they're doing or, you know, what they're making and more so just out of interest and not that I care what they make. I want players to make as much as they can. I think it's awesome. And good. even our young guys, when they, when they sign a deal, you know, when it's happened quite a few times over the years where a young guy will come out of j- junior and then sign his first entry level, I'm like, man, good for you. You know? And then, then when they sign that after their entry level, they sign that next deal of whatever, it's going to be a million dollars, two million, whatever. It's like, it's, it's awesome. Like it's oh, yeah. good for you. Like that's, that's a bit of a game changer for some of these kids and some of these families, you know? So, oh, yeah. I mean, and it's setting them up to be, uh, you know, like that's, they don't, they don't have to think about what am I going to do after I finish. Hopefully. Hockey, exactly. Right? Now, yeah. A lot of them probably should think about that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe give it a thought. Some, yeah. Most of them don't. The yeah. worst part is most of the guys that don't think about it are the guys that aren't signing those big deals. They're the ones just making no money and trying to, trying to make that, trying to make that jump and aren't thinking about life after hockey. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I know for my kid, I made him promise that, uh, uh, when he signs with whatever NHL team that I get the, uh, that he buys me uh, a Porsche, uh, I want a Carrera. And then, uh, he says, well, I'm going to get it in whatever the primary color of that team is. So I just hope it's not San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a nice baby blue. Yeah. Be teal. Sweet. And teal. Yeah. A little teal. <laughs> yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, but no, I, I, in saying that though, I think for, this is something too, that even for young players to kind of think of a little bit, like not that they're going to be, you get drafted wherever you're pumped. It doesn't matter. You're not thinking about tax brackets or, or taxing taxes or anything like that, obviously, but it's definitely something that's going to come up and that has come up in negotiations for sure. And I think it's something that, you know, young players should take mind of a little bit, you know, and, and not, and not, not to say that you have any leverage as a young player in your first, second, third year, really. Mm-hmm. But if you have a good year, like, like Suzuki's doing right now and, now that next negotiation, it's something that I'm sure is going to be a little bit of a topic because, you know, don't be surprised if you see him sign for maybe a little bit more than maybe you thought he's worth, but he's playing in a, in a, in a city that he's going to, his take home is going to be way less, right? Yeah. Well, when I looked at his points, I thought, oh, he's probably going to sign for 6 million next time. I think he's going to sign for more than that because uh, he was that good in the playoffs. They, yeah. They maybe have a number one center now and they haven't had that in a while. Yeah. No, oh, for sure. Definitely. Well, man, this has been awesome. This has been really, yeah. really good. And what, uh, so what's the next thing that like, what do you got next? What are you going to, you got anything else doing up there? Like you don't have to share the details, but you have anything else up there that we're not going to steal off you? Uh, yeah, no, I got to focus on my kids hockey <laughs> again and, uh, yeah, try and get them ice. That's, that's the biggest challenge right yeah. now. Yeah. Now you've got real quick, we'll go back to parenting because I always love talking about kids and families and stuff, but, um, you've got, so your, your, your children stretch from 18 to three, right? Yeah. So you've got the whole gamut. You've got elementary school right up to almost going to college university covered. Yeah, I got a kid who's in, uh, my daughter's in Norway right now. She's uh, going to school there. So oh, cool. Worked out from... Uh, and now, was she, was she able to go through the whole... Yeah, my wife's Norwegian, so okay. she has, yeah, my kids have citizenship. And so. is she there now? Yeah. So she, no she, no problem with travel? Everything was well, good? We were all supposed to go. Uh, it was going to be like a big family trip this summer, and then uh, they all got, the flights got canceled. And luckily for us, we booked with uh, Icelandic Air because they were cheapest, but they actually gave us the money back versus, oh, okay. you know, having over $10,000 in credit with Air Canada. For sure. Not to trounce anyone on No, the, no, the definitely, yeah. Me, you know? Yeah. Um, happy yeah. to get a refund. Yeah, that's and, good. Um, yeah, and then I got, uh, yeah, 15-year-old who's uh, going back to high school, and then, uh, yeah, he's a minor midget this year, so. Cool. So it's a big year. Yeah, it'll be a yeah. fun year. Unfortunately, it's a little bit weird right now, but I'm hopeful that, the big thing that I'm lo- that I'm looking at right now, just on the hockey side of things, is how school goes back and across North America. So if school goes back okay, and the numbers are going to bump for sure a little bit, I'm sure, but they can kind of stabilize and we can get them down again. Then 
hopefully by like December, even November, December, we can get into some competition and games and, and try to get the, you know, the ball rolling right or the, in the right direction. But I think right now you get a lot of pushback and, and I think it's mostly from parents that are just losing it because they can't play and their kids can't play. And, yeah. and I do feel bad for the minor midget years or the NHL draft pick years that are, you know, these are big years for some of these kids. Mm-hmm. And, and even, you know, the other thing too, that's going to be tough is even if kids can play. So let's say, uh, minor midget can play it's great but they're not gonna be able to go down to you know to, to the u.s u.s scouts aren't gonna be able to come up which in in canada is not a huge deal right now at those younger ages but as they get older like you think of you know these these guys in their nhl draft years there's not the scouts can't come up to canada in the next month or two yeah. even if they're playing so it's gonna be it'll be weird that way too for the unfortunately for some of these kids that are in their draft that maybe have a real good start to the season if the seasons get going and they're not able to get viewed as much as maybe they normally would, right? So yeah, I mean it's it's hard to know how that's all going to look, but there's not going to be the exposure. There aren't the big tournaments. There's not yeah. going to be you know oh we made it to the finals, so there's going to be a whole bunch of people here looking at us. That's, that's the thing, right? Now. Yeah, you may have a lot of like just cameras and, and iPads with people watching from uh, from their devices and trying to scope kids off iPads and stuff because it'll be and I guarantee if things go start like popping off as far as we're playing and we're back at it. You're going to see a lot of parents investing money in video cameras and sending tapes to uh, to people oh, for it's sure. It's already crazy as it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's the the hockey thing. It's it's frustrating. I mean, I think I don't want to be critical, uh, but I will be. Uh, yeah. I think we're missing a little bit of a window in terms of this is a time when uh, the kids could have been playing and some of the you know the startup to the season could have happened because I you know the reality is I do think things are going to slow down uh, again because we're going to see this you know uh, fabled second wave uh, yeah. come. When you look at sort of pandemics across history, respiratory pandemics, they always hit again worse in the fall. I hate to be a downer and say yeah, yeah. that, but it's the reality of what happens as people go indoors and uh, and the weather gets cooler. So yeah. we're going to see things slow down again, and then hopefully we're able to open up in a meaningful way. And, yeah. you know, for school, sure, that's for, definitely that's important, but you'd like them to, you know, follow their passions as well and be able to play. No, definitely. Now, for you as a, like in, in the medical field and obviously being a professional in that area, um, I'm just – hockey guy so i've got i got no brain for the for the for the medical part of it but um i didn't feel the way that the the media and the and the way that you heard about all this stuff going like it's going to pop off when march when everything shut down like mm-hmm. basically stay in your house don't move and and um but it wasn't as bad as everyone thought which is great and i think canada did a pretty good job overall of handling it and kind of closing things down and maybe maybe a little bit rash but regardless i think our numbers were pretty good overall but i i guess as a professional were the numbers as high as everyone thought they were going to be or was it okay like was it pretty and decent that way locally we did really well yeah. you know we uh we built capacity uh or the hospitals the uh, local health unit built capacity to deal with um an influx of cases that never really happened so that's yeah. great but if you compare us to what happened in the u.s and you look at like new york and they're you know they're bringing bodies out yeah. into, into refrigerated trucks you realize how bad it could have actually sure. been and the you know the capacity for a large, large number of cases just wasn't there. Yeah. And then, you know, as you get 100 cases, you're going to have a few that turn bad and need all that extra support. Definitely. And uh, so we're lucky uh, the way things have gone so far. Um, It's just hard to know. You know, I'm like everybody else. I just want things to go back to normal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my my thing with the second wave. I'm hopeful that the second wave isn't going to be as bad as I think it's going to be. And may, you know, I think if things slow a bit fine, but I just hope there's not a lot, like I really feel bad for like the, the small businesses and like we had, we have a small biz- business, we had to shut down, but restaurants and bars and things like that, like that, uh, that got affected, you know, really, really, really hard. Right. And yeah. I think, you know, if they do shut down again, that could be the end of even more of them. Cause a lot of them did have to lose their business and stuff. So I think if we can kind of, hopefully that second wave isn't bad and we can kind of keep limping through it a little bit and then hopefully, you know, yeah, with some precaution, we can kind of keep moving forward. Um, any advice as a, a kind of a hockey dad that's gone through it a little bit because it's always something I always like to chat a little bit about. But now you've gone through, you know, obviously Bantams and, and Midgets now and your boy's 15 and it was draft year. Um, how, and you're, you know, not being, you know, being a professional and stuff, how did you find it going through it as far as just being a dad? So taking everything else out of it, like, did you find it stressful? Was it Was it tough, like at that triple A level going to tournaments, things like that, thinking of the draft, you're making teams, all that. Like, was it? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, looking back, you realize that things you thought were important aren't really that important. Uh, um, last couple of years, my, uh, my son's played spring hockey and, uh, and I think there's value in it because, uh, probably is uh there's an exposure you're getting played against you're getting to play against the top players um and play with top players and so yeah. that's different right you can be a good player on a bad team but can you be a good player on a good team still 
Uh, so I think there was value there, but then we'd be at these tournaments and you, you know, you see the parents and they've got these, you know, seven or eight year old kids and you realize like, it doesn't matter at this point because, yeah. um, you know, those kids, a lot of the best players at that age won't even be playing hockey by the time it, they get later on. It's hard to predict who, who those kids are going to be, but, uh, I'd say don't go crazy. You know, when you hear the parents yeah. yelling at the ref and you just got to kind of shake your head. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, focus on skating, skill development. Yeah, uh, yeah. What else did you want me to say? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> yeah, it's right uh, here. All the things. No, I, I really think no, that's, but I think that's like, where your focus needs to be. Yeah. I think you gotta, you gotta recognize that, uh, your reason why you're doing all this stuff. Yeah. You, everyone dreams about, uh, their kid you know, playing professional hockey or getting a scholarship or being in the OHL. But the reason why you're doing it is to kind of instill character and teach them a little bit of resilience skills that are going to be transferable as they move into other things. Right. Like I, yeah. I, I don't make a living in hockey. I make a living as a physician. And, uh, you know, if any of my kids end up on that route, I, I think I'd be pretty happy for them that they did that. And, uh, if they make it in the NHL, then great. Maybe I get my Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your teal Porsche. Uh, I, I 100% agree with you. I think that's what I think we, as parents, and I'll put myself in that in that bucket, but I think we lose our reason of why we put our kids in. Like, oh, my kids are young, so now it's like exactly that. Oh, we'll put them into gymnastics. We'll put them into hockey. We'll put them into soccer. Just try different things. Try it out. And then all of a sudden, they get good at something, and then, you know, that that, that passion as a parent and that, six, you know, you want, your parent, you want your kids to be successful takes over, and then then we all become a little bit too crazy and just like, come on, you know, you got to be better. You got to play hard. You got to go practice. And my little guy's going to be eight coming up and he, he likes hockey. And if I said, Hey, let's go to the rink, he'd go. But I, I, he hasn't been on the ice much at all, but I've got a lot of friends in that pocket that have a lot of, you know, kids at that age that are, it's uh, amazing to me how much hockey they're doing, like driving to Toronto for spring hockey, going here for this, doing a bunch of skill development sessions here, which is again, totally fine. But to your point, like, seven eight years old man like yeah well and i think putting them into lots of different sports exposing them to different things you're going to decrease your chance of having uh injuries you're going to help them develop uh uh just motor skills and help them develop you know core muscles things, something like gymnastics uh, yeah yeah i remember when my daughter was in gymnastics you know she'd go in for five minutes she'd pull herself up the rope and go down it's two stories right and i go out there and i managed to get up and then i could not get down and rope burn the whole way and <laughs> not doing that again right yeah but you know the core muscle strength yeah, totally, that they yeah. is amazing yeah and uh and then that translates you know she plays soccer she plays uh, hockey and it helps right yeah. it helps having that um the other thing i'd say um is you know don't get caught up in where your kids playing or at what level they're playing i think you want your kid to play at the level that they should be at and hockey's notorious for all the politics that go into uh you know to who makes which team yeah but um you know like i think about my son who's playing triple a now but he played double a for a while and uh you know, he was a really good double-A player. They won the OHF, and I thought for sure he was going to triple-A, and he didn't make triple-A. And then, you know, we ended, he ended up playing triple-A uh, for the for the Chiefs, a mm-hmm. great coach, Jason yeah. Clark. And uh, But he, it was the right time for him to go to triple-A, and he ended up being a really good triple-A player. And yeah. then uh, it worked out for him. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't chase, you know, the, that extra letter too much. I would have yeah. your kid be a, a really good player at the level they're supposed to be at because you got to, you know – you want to be a really good player in double a or do you want to be a you know a player that doesn't see the ice much and plays a very minor role in triple a and you know i think you you solidify the skills at one level and maybe take them to the next and yeah i don't know i think uh having to battle through something uh uh for sure it's it's going to help your kids right oh, it's going totally to help them to because they're going to they're going to face adversity later in life and this is one of the things that i worry about is you know like people don't like to be criticized now and uh you know pointed at but there has to be some of that right it's uh life isn't like that once you get out there you no, know when, when you sure. go, when you go to see when you go to see a surgeon you want someone who's uh you know uh worked hard to get to where they're at not just you know they were pushed through and uh so i think about that all the time in terms of what we're doing with our our own training and uh, of the medical residents and of the medical students and you know they're i think in so many ways they're better than we were when when, when i came through but in other ways i worry about some of the things that we've taken away from them in terms of the struggle that has to be there yeah well i mean i'm sure when you came through the doctors weren't like nicey nice and wore white gloves they'd probably tell you exactly how it was now yeah. if you ripped on some you know some some student coming in or you know what i mean like some inter like Oh, it'd be, it'd be uh, right. Like yeah. you got to watch it. I'd be, oh, it'd, it'd be a lot. There'd be a lot of problems. Right. So, right. um, some of the, for sure, some of the fun's gone, um, yeah. <laughs> but some of that wasn't fun. And, uh, um, 
you know, I do think of some of the things that maybe didn't serve a purpose, but you kind of like it, right? You yeah. know, um, the, the joking, the little bit of the locker room mentality, not that it has to be vulgar, but there, you know, you don't, you don't hear those jokes anymore. So you miss it, but you got to adjust and, yeah. uh, and particularly in, in the kind of world that I, I uh, live in, you can't, uh, you can't be irreverent. No, <laughs> for sure. Like, and that's the one thing I, yeah. I think the one thing with hockey overall is that locker room culture, especially with the, get with the older guys, like it's still there. Like the guys are still ripping on you. If you have a bit of a bald spot at 22, you're going to, you're going to know about it yeah. by the time you're 22. Like oh, the boys yeah. will let you know, like it's still there a little bit. You know what I mean? But that's, that's how I grew up. It's fun yeah. when I get around my buddies. I, that's how we still are. But I, I'll be honest with you, like if I'm dealing with the younger groups or you, I'm a little more sensitive on what I'm saying or how I'm joking and stuff. And just because I don't want things to get taken out of context. I don't want somebody to go home and tell their parent that I told us that I said whatever. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just. Well, I was. Uh, so for uh, one of my younger kids, I uh, like in North London, I. Uh, do some coaching stuff there and uh we're on the ice at thanksgiving and uh or just after thanksgiving and i say hey uh hey did any of you turkeys eat turkey and uh, one of the little kids puts his hand up and says uh don't call us turkeys and they're like seven years old and i thought oh my gosh like is that is that Starting. what you're gonna is that what you're gonna get from yeah. from today I yeah didn't mean to you know talk in a negative way yeah. about you i was just yeah. joking around a little bit trying to get you to smile and warm up and, totally you know. <laughs> yeah the thing with that so this is my take on this and when I see that kid who's that, and we've all had those kids on the ice that yeah. are whatever sensitive, was there, just or that kid who's just a kind of a not listening, kind of a sporadic, and we all had ADHD as kids, just never got diagnosed, but those kids are just all over the place and maybe a little disrespectful, whatever. Go meet their parents and then go back to that seven year old bit. Sorry, bud, you just got dealt <laughs> a tough hand, man. Like you're going to have to battle yeah. through this one because, and no knock on the parents sometimes, but I am knocking on the parents, but it's just, the way some of these parents parent, and I'm I'm faulty of this too. Like so, I'm not, I'm putting myself in this bucket a little bit too. But they just allow their kids to do things. They do, you know what I mean? It's and they're ultra sensitive to everything. And so now all of a sudden, you know, it's you meet some of these kids, and you're like, dude, where's this coming from? And and yeah. as an adult, we know where it's coming from. But it's like, you know, you gotta you gotta. The, life's gonna be hard. Yeah. Right. And and it, it, this it's gonna be a harder path if you can't take a joke or if you can't you know laugh about something or if you yeah. can't you know take criticism. Like that's gonna be a tough grind, man. Yeah. When it's just not, you're just constantly on edge, and there's no you lose a lot of the connection that can happen in terms of you know just the positive relationship building that can happen as you. I think I think about trainees. I think about uh, uh, you know the the residents, the medical students. Just a lot of the a lot of the fun is gone from uh, from the interactions that used to be there. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, tough. It's, it's hard to address that. Yeah, no. So yeah. I mean, so when I get home tonight, I'm just gonna start carving my kids again. <laughs> it's gonna be locker room mentality at home, professional at work. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If my kids like they're uh, they're not all, but for the most part, they're pretty competitive, and uh, and so we, I don't know. We try and channel that. Like we'll play crib, but we'll, we do push up cribs. So love uh, it. Yeah. yeah, whatever the other person points, that's what you do in push ups. So it's a good way for dad to get push ups in. Great. And, uh, you know your kids yeah. doing at least a hundred push ups. Yeah. So when you lose, you're like, I wanted to lose. I'm working on my chest, <laughs> exactly. my packs. Yeah. Exactly. Look at me, I'm ripped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure, like with five, and you got some older kids, like there's chirps going on. Like I'm like my wife often looked at me and like Dwayne, like they're not your buddies. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're kind of my buddies, man. Yeah. Like they're my. You spend all your time with your kids, right? Like <laughs> totally. Like yeah. so, I'm like throwing little carbs here and there, whatever. I'm trying to be sensitive to it, but I also want them to be like, you gotta have tough skin sometimes. And I'm trying to be as honest and 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 straight to the point with my kids as I can. You know, whether it's death, we talk about that. Whether it's, you know, you're acting like an idiot. You know, and yeah. I'm always like, you can't. Say, he's acting like an idiot. Like he's eight years old. He's starting to get this a little bit. Like, you know, you've got to be. I didn't say you're an idiot. I yeah. said you acting like an idiot you gotta you know whatever it is right you gotta you gotta twist it a little See, bit that'll so. come back at you though, yeah, oh, so yeah. i get it from oh, yeah. i'm a 15 year old all yeah. the time you know he'll throw <laughs> stuff back at me that i say and i'm like oh, guaranteed man. you know like oh you know if i'm doing a workout or playing hockey or something i'll hurt myself and i'll come back and he'll be like oh was it worth it you know because he's super competitive and he'll come home his leg will be all scabbed up from sure blocking a shot playing basketball and then landing on a kid and i'm like you know was that worth it right and, yeah and then he says that back to me i'm like oh, where yeah. have i heard that before love it yeah, yeah. i love that stuff that's no, but I mean, I think that's part of the resiliency. That's the, I think the biggest thing that you want to build in your kids. And, uh, I'm not saying we do it perfectly, but we yeah. try. Yeah. No, for sure. And I, I guess, I mean, you're kind of there a little bit, but like, I always joke, like, I won't know if I've done a good job or bad job with my kids until like, they're like, you know, 12 and then 15 and then realistically like 20, 25, if they're moving back to my house at 30, I've messed up unless yeah. there's something bad that had like some drastic, but like I, if they've gone broke and they've broken up and they need to come move back to my house, 
there's something wrong. Like, well, that's where we had five, right? Because we, we figured we gotta we gotta get some wins out of that, right? Yeah, you know what? I better get back to it then. I I only got two. I gotta keep going. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying you should do that, right? Yeah, you got way better odds than me though. Of, yeah. of having a, yeah one that's successful. Yeah, I yeah, hope so. I, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Well, listen, buddy, I really appreciate you coming on, man. This has been awesome. And um, yeah, this, I, I love the stuff. That I know we kind of got off tangent, which I love to do. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, this, the the uh, the taxes and the, and the the stuff that you brought in was awesome. So we'll. Uh, yeah, I think it's a structured advantage, and I think that uh, you got to spell it out a bit more, right? Uh, I feel like a lot of people are talking about it uh, tangentially, but you got to bring it back to what does that uh, no tax mean in terms of a player signing a contract, and then ultimately uh, what that hit is against the salary cap and what that discount was. And I think if you're in a Canadian, if you're a fan of any of the Canadian teams, you're you're not going to uh, you're going to have a hard time winning because you don't have that structured advantage. And how many times do you hear like Toronto fans lose it because they can't get this guy or they don't have any money or they're st- or they're cap strapped? Yeah. You oh, know, Burke, like Burke said it uh, earlier in the year, like, oh, they'd love to have five. They've spent forty point five million, but they'd love to have five million uh, um, uh, to go sign a defenseman. And I, you know, when he said it, I thought, yeah, if you were in Tampa, you'd have that five million, right? Like, right. You know, I just, yeah. So yeah. anyway, my friends will be happy. I'll stop talking about this now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now you can just you can just throw them to the show. Just check this out. If yeah. you guys want to hear me, hear me anymore, you can listen to this. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Danny uh, texted me. He's like, "Oh, uh, quiz time. Uh, what do uh, three out of the four teams uh, um, have in common that are still alive in the Stanley Cup playoffs?" And I was like, "Yeah. What have I been telling? Yeah. You, right? so, yeah. 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 It's awesome. So there. Now I can send them this. And uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> well, thanks, buddy. That was, yeah, that was awesome, man. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks. All right. First three steps, huge strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today. 